Welcome to the Drift and Ramble podcast. I'm Steve Blizzen. Each episode, we'll explore true stories and American legends. From the pages of history and a few stories handed down over the years, we'll look at the people, places, and events that helped shape a nation. Stories of survival, notable frontier men and women, explorers who struck it rich, and the outlaws that stole it from them. There'll be studies of saloon girls, swindlers, banditry, and bad men, profiles of lawmen and American Indians, and the good and evil that existed between them. We'll amble through the past, we'll delve into the folklore of the times, and maybe even uncover a ghost story or two. So, saddle up, or settle in, for the Drift and Ramble podcast. Nate Love, spelled N-A-T, is the most famous African-American cowboy of the Old West. How do we know this? Because Nate himself tells us he is. His book, published in 1907, is titled The Life and Adventures of Nate Love, better known in cattle country as Deadwood Dick, by himself. A true history of slavery days, life on the great cattle ranges and on the plains of the wild and woolly west, based on facts and personal experiences of the author. And this incredible autobiography is everything it promises to be. While many of the tales told in this tone do stand a bit tall in the saddle, the collection of stories themselves offers something unique, the black perspective of the American West. Despite the braggadocio contained between the pages, Nate Love proves to be a lovable character and an American hero of the Old West. This is Episode 19. Born into slavery in June of 1854 on Robert Love's plantation in Davidson County, Tennessee, Nate Love would turn his humble childhood into a classic story of coming of age during the final days of slavery. A childhood full of youthful mischief and rural adventure that eventually lead to a life in the saddle on the open plains of the Old West. His autobiography would make him the most famous cowboy of color in American history. He went from pauper to author with a laundry list of escapades and even time spent as a Pullman porter in between. There is no doubt Nate Love's story is exceptional. Though we would never meet Nate as a child, nor as a cowboy, when we finally do meet this man, his exploits are mostly behind him, and he is now a storyteller on a train. The Wild West was a melting pot of different races, creeds, colors, and kin. German, Irish, and Chinese immigrants mixed with indigenous peoples, Mexican nationals, and the many adventurous souls who sought wealth and opportunity on American soil. But not everyone came here willingly. And as the Wild West was being tamed, the African Americans, who first arrived here on slave ships, found themselves in a strange transition. Once expected to work solely just to earn their keep, the abolitionist movement was altering the course of history in unexpected ways. Soon, slaves would become freed men, but the freedom America promised did not come without its price. As Union soldiers marched towards victory during the Civil War, some once thriving plantation owners were forced to sell their land, and others were burned out of their houses. Some were simply bankrupt by the fall of the Confederacy. Slavery was defeated in 1863, but in the sea of opportunity that followed, many islands of old ideals stood fast against the tide of the New South. Expectations and realities were still very different in the days following the abolition of slavery. Freed men were finding themselves struggling to provide for their families as they chose to either flee from or stay with the only homes they'd ever known. The exact date of my birth I never knew because in those days no count was kept of such trivial matters such as the birth of a slave baby. They were born and died and the account was balanced in the gains and losses of the master's chattels. 
and one more or less did not matter much in one way or another. My father and mother were owned by Robert Love, an extensive planter and the owner of many slaves. He was, in his way, and in comparison with many other slave owners of those days, a kind and indulgent master. My father was sort of the foreman of the slaves on the plantation, and my mother presided over the kitchen at the big house and my master's table, and among her duties were to milk the cows and run the loom, weaving clothing for the other slaves. This left her scant time to look after me, so I acquired the habit of looking out for myself. The other members of father's family were my sister, Sally, about eight years old, and my brother, Jordan, about five. My sister Sally was supposed to look after me when my mother was otherwise occupied, but between my sister's duties of helping mother and chasing flies from master's table, I received very little looking after from any of the family. Therefore, necessity compelled me at an early age to look after myself and rustle my own grub. I used to think it was not the country's fault, but the fault of the men who made the laws. Of all the curses of this fair land, the greatest curse of all was the slave auction block of the South, where human flesh was bought and sold. Husbands were torn from their wives, the baby from its mother's breast, and the most sacred commands of God were violated under the guise of modern law, or the law of the land, which for more than 200 years has boasted of its freedom and the freedom of its people. Some of the slaves like us had kind and indulgent masters, these were lucky indeed, as their lot was somewhat improved over the less fortunate brothers. But even their lot was the same of that of the horse or cow of the present day. They were never allowed to get anything in the nature of education, as smart Negroes were not much in demand at the time, and the reason was too apparent. Education meant the death of the institution of slavery in this country, and so the slave owners took good care that their slaves got none of it. Go and see the play of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and you will see the black man's life as I saw it as a child. And Harriet Beecher Stowe, the black man's savior, well deserves the sacred shrine she holds, along with the great Lincoln, in the black man's heart. All aboard. All aboard now. Hey, mister, were you in the Civil War? <laughs> oh, no, child. No, 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 sir. When I was ten years old, the war broke out between the North and the South, and there was little else talked about among the slaves as well as the slave owners in the neighborhood. And naturally, the many different stories we heard worked us children into a high state of excitement, so much so that we wanted to go to war and fight for the Union, because among us slave children there was no difference of opinion as to which side was right. The Union was it, and we were all Yankees. Not being able to go to war as our masters did, we concluded to play war. Accordingly, I gathered all the boys of the neighborhood together into a regiment, which it was my intention to divide us into two parties of rebels and Yankees. But in this I met an insurmountable obstacle. Not one of the boys wanted to be a rebel. Consequently, we had to look elsewhere for an enemy to give us battle and serve as a vent for our growing enthusiasm. The next Sunday, preceding the organization of our regiment, we started out over the surrounding country in quest of trouble, which we were not long in finding, as we soon ran across a nest of yellow jackets. These we proceeded to exterminate, in which we were successful after a short but destructive battle. We suffered considerably in wounded, but lost none of our soldiers. This engagement we called the capture of Fort Hell. For some time thereafter, we made regular raids into the surrounding country in quest of an enemy. We were eventually successful in our quest, as in quick order we ran across and captured a company of bumblebees. This we called the Battle of the Wilderness. Victory over a nest of hornets we called the capture of Fort Sumter. A large nest of wasps gave us perhaps the hardest fight of our campaigning. This we ran across in the fields not far from home. There was an unusually large number of them, and as is usually the case with these insects, they proved very ferocious. Nothing loath, however, 
we attacked with cheers only to be driven back time and time again. And finally, we were compelled to make a very undignified retreat at full speed in the direction of home. Not to be beaten, however, we secured reinforcements and more ammunition in the shape of old rags and brooms and so forth and returned to the charge. And although we were driven back several times, we stayed until we won out and the last insect lay a quivering mass on the ground. There was not one among us not wounded in some manner, and for myself I had had enough of it. My nose looked like a Dutch slipper, and it was several days before my eyes were able to perform the duties for which they were made. However, the Union forces were victorious, and we were happy. Our masters told us that if the soldiers caught us, they would hang us all, which had the effect of keeping most of us close around home. Master had gone to join Lee's forces, taking with him father, who was engaged in building forts, which work kept him with the Confederate Army until General Grant arrived in the country. From then on, the Union soldiers passed the neighborhood most every day on their way south to join the fighting regiments. We soon found out that they would not hurt us, and they were the wonderment and pride of our youthful minds. They would take everything they could find to eat for themselves and horses, leaving the plantation stripped clean of provisions and food, which entailed considerable misery and hardship for those left at home, especially the colored people who were not used to such a state of affairs and were not accustomed to providing for their own wants. Finally, Lee surrendered, and Master returned home. But in common with other Masters of those days, he did not tell us we were free, and instead of letting us go, he made us work for him the same as before. But in all other respects, he was kind. He moved our log cabin on a piece of ground on a hill owned by him, and in most respects, things went on the same as before the war. It was quite a while after this that we found out that we were free, and good news, like bad news, sometimes travels fast. It was not long before all the slaves in the surrounding country were celebrating their freedom, and Mazza Lincoln was the hero of us all. While a great many slaves rejoiced at the altered state of affairs, still many were content to remain as before and work for their old masters in return for their keep. My father, however, decided to start out for himself, to that end, he rented 20 acres of land, including that on which our cabin stood, from our late master. Here, ma'am, let me give you a hand with that bag. Oh, why, thank you. Is that your little sister? Oh, how sweet. That's my daughter. She sure does bear a resemblance. Do you like horses? Young lady, when I was about your age, I loved horses. I used to break horses, you know, so other folks could ride them. Not far from our house, there was a horse ranch owned by a Mr. Williams. He had two sons about my age, and often I would go and see them on Sundays. As I was very fond of riding horses, most of the horses on the ranch were very wild. So one day, the oldest boy and I made a plan to break the young colts. The only chance we had in doing so was on Sunday when the family went to church, as we did not think Mr. Williams would approve of our plan. Mr. Williams' boy said he would give me ten cents for every colt I broke. That was perfectly satisfactory to me. The money was made of shin plaster of those days, or paper. The next Sunday I started to break horses. We did not dare put the bridle on them as we were afraid the boss might surprise us and we would not be quick enough to get it off. Our mode of procedure was to drive one at a time in the barn, get it in a stall, then, after much difficulty, I would manage to get on its back. The door was open, and the pole removed, and the horse liberated with me on its back. Then the fun would commence. The colt would run, jump, kick, and pitch all around the barn in his efforts to throw me off. But he might as well have tried to jump out of his skin because I held on to its mane and stuck to him like a leech. The colt would usually keep up his bucking until he could buck no more, and then I would get my ten cents. Ten cents is a small amount of money in these days, but in those days, 
That amount was worth more to me than ten dollars now. Well, we went on Sunday after Sunday, and I broke about a dozen colts in this way, and also managed to do it without the boss discovering the favor I was undoubtedly doing him in breaking all of his wild horses. Only his boys were aware of the doings, and they paid me, so I had no scruples about what I was doing, especially as it afforded me great fun. Finally, the boys wanted me to break a big, handsome black horse called Black Highwaymen. Knowing the horse's uncertain temper and wild disposition, and taking into consideration its size, I refused to break him for ten cents. As the fact was, I was rather scared of him. After considerable bargaining in which I held out for 50 cents, we finally compromised on 25 cents. But I can assure you it was more for the money than the fun of the thing that I finally consented to ride him. With great difficulty, we managed to get him into the stall as we did the others. But I no sooner landed on his back than he jumped in the manger with me hanging on his mane. Finally, the door was opened and the pole removed and out of the barn he shot like a black cloud. Around the yard we flew, then over the garden fence. At this juncture, the track hounds became interested and promptly followed us. Over the fields we went, the horse clearing the highest fences and other obstacles in his way with the greatest ease. My seat on his back was not the most comfortable place in the world, but as the horse did not invent any disposition to stop and let me get off, I concluded to remain where I was. All the dogs of the neighborhood were fast joining in the race, and I had quite a respectable following. After running about two miles, we cleared a fence into a pasture where there was a large number of other horses and young colts who promptly stampeded as we joined them. Highwaymen taking the lead with me on his back, looking very much like a toad, and all the dogs in the country strung out in the rear. Naturally, we formed a spectacle that could not fail to attract the attention of the neighbors, who as soon as possible mounted horses and started in pursuit and vainly tried to catch my black mount, but could get nowhere near him, while I, without a bridle or anything to control him, could do nothing but let him run as all the other horses bunched around us and the dogs kept up a continual din. I simply held on and let him go. It was a question of breaking the horse or breaking my neck. We went over everything, through everything, and finally, the killing pace told, black highwaymen fell. A thoroughly exhausted and completely conquered and well-broken horse. As for myself, I was none the worse for my exciting ride. But on looking for my 25 cents, I found it gone. The boys had paid me in advance as I insisted and I had tied the money up in the corner of my shirt tail, and during my wild ride it had come untied and worked out. This was a great misfortune to me, and for a while I was inconsolable. I asked the boys if they would make it right, but no, they had paid me once, and they refused to give me another quarter. This riled me considerable, and I told them, all right, to come again when they wanted a horse broken. That settled us and the horse breaking. The experiences I gained in riding during these times often stood me in good stead in after years during my wild life on the Western Plains. Mr. Williams, of course, heard of my last ride, but instead of being angry, he seemed to see the funny side of it, which I could not. The spectators wondered how in the world I ever escaped a broken neck, and I have often wondered how I escaped in after years from situations that seemed to be sure death. But escape I did, and I am now hale and hearty, without pain, with muscles like iron, and able at any time to run a hundred yards in eleven seconds, or jump a six-foot fence. At the age of fifteen, Nate sells two chickens, earns fifty cents, and uses the money to enter a raffle for a horse. He wins. Then, the owner of the horse offers to buy the animal back for fifty dollars, and Nate, realizing that he needs the money more than a horse, swiftly obliges. The owner then immediately creates a second raffle, and Nate wins the horse for a second time. 
Once again, the owner offers $50 to buy the horse back, and Nate goes home with nearly $100. He gives his mother half, and a month later sets out on his own to better his condition. It was on the 10th day of February, 1869, that I left the old home near Nashville, Tennessee. I was, at that time, about 15 years old, and though while young in years, the hard work and farm life had made me strong and hardy, much beyond my years, and I had full confidence in myself as being able to take care of myself and, and making my way. I at once struck out for Kansas, of which I had heard something, and believing it was a good place in which to seek employment, it was in the West, and it was the great West I wanted to see. And so by walking and occasional lifts from farmers going my way, and taking advantage of everything that promised to assist me on my way, I eventually brought up at Dodge City, Kansas, which at the time was a typical frontier city, with a great many saloons, dance halls, and gambling houses, and very little of anything else. When I arrived, the town was full of cowboys from the surrounding ranches, and from Texas and other parts of the West. As Kansas was a great cattle center and market, the wild cowboy prancing horses of which I was very fond, and the wild life, generally, all had their attractions for me, and I decided to try for a place with them. Although it seemed to me I had met with a bad outfit, at least some of them. Going around among them, I watched my chances to get to speak with them as I wanted to find someone who I thought would give me a civil answer to the questions I wanted to ask. But they all seemed too wild around town. <laughs> So the next day, I went out to where they were in camp. Approaching a party who were eating their breakfast, I got to speak with them. They asked me to have some breakfast with them, which invitation I gladly accepted. During the meal, I got a chance to ask them many questions. They proved to be a Texas outfit who had just come up with a herd of cattle, and having delivered them, they were preparing to return. There were several colored cowboys among them, and good ones, too. After breakfast, I asked the camp boss for a job as a cowboy. He asked me if I could ride a wild horse. I said, yes, sir. He said, if you can, I will give you a job. So he spoke to one of the colored cowboys named Bronco Jem and told him to go out and rope old Goodeye, saddle him, and put me on his back. Bronco Jim gave me a few pointers and told me to look out, for the horse was especially bad on pitching. I told Jim I was a good rider and not afraid of him. I thought I had rode pitching horses before, but from the time I mounted old Goodeye, I knew I had not learned what pitching was. This proved to be the worst horse to ride I had ever mounted in my life. But I stayed with him, and the cowboys were the most surprised outfit you ever saw as they had taken me for a tenderfoot, pure and simple. After the horse got tired and I dismounted, the boss said he would give me a job and pay me $30 per month, and more later on. He asked what my name was, and I answered, Nate Love. He said to the boys, We will call him Red River Dick. I went by this name for a long time. Nate was hired on and outfitted with a saddle, bridle, spurs, chaps, and a set of two blankets. He also received a fine Colt 45 revolver. Though he had no experience with the pistol upon receiving it, he would find out how it worked the very next day when the Duval outfit, his group of 15 cowboys, were attacked by Indians. Not far from Dodge City on our way home, we encountered a band of the old Victoria tribe of Indians and had a sharp fight. These Indians were nearly always harassing travelers and traders and the stockmen of this part of the country, and were very troublesome. In this band we encountered, there were about a hundred painted bucks, all well mounted. When we saw the Indians, they were coming after us, yelling like demons. As we were not expecting Indians at this particular time, we were all taken somewhat by surprise. We had only 15 men in our outfit, but nothing daunted. We stood our ground and fought the Indians to a stand. 
One of the boys was shot off his horse and killed near me. Uh, the Indians got his horse, bridle, and saddle. During this fight, we lost all but six of our horses, our entire packing outfit, and our extra saddle horses, which the Indians stampeded, then rounded up after the fight and drove them off. And as we only had six horses left us, we were unable to follow them, although we had the satisfaction of knowing that we had made several good Indians out of bad ones. This was my first Indian fight, and likewise the first Indians I had ever seen. When I saw them coming after us and heard their blood-curdling yell, I lost all courage and thought my time had come to die. I was too badly scared to run. Some of the boys told me to use my gun and shoot for all I was worth. Now, I had just gotten my outfit and had never shot off a gun in my life. But their words brought me back to earth, and seeing they were all using their guns in a way that showed me they were used to it, I unlimbered my artillery, and after the first shot, I lost all fear and fought like a veteran. In just about three years' time, Nate would find himself working with a new outfit, and soon a more recognizable moniker, when he earned the name of Deadwood Dick, a name that Nate was quite proud of. Nate Love may not have been the first or the only man known as Deadwood Dick, however. In reality, Dicks from Deadwood were a dime a dozen, and Deadwood Dick was also a character from dime novels that were popular at the time. From an article that appeared in Deadwood Magazine in the year 2000, titled Deadwood Dicks by the Dozens, writer Janine P. Gurin tells us about the many machinations of Deadwood Dick and the real names behind them. More than one man laid claim to the moniker, but Deadwood Dick was actually a fictional character who rode through the pages of 1800s paperbacks. Under the pseudonyms of Ned Buntline and Edward L. Wheeler, Edward Zane Carroll Judson wrote tales of Western adventures, blending his mythical Deadwood Dick, Dashing Dave, and Fearless Frank with real people like Calamity Jane and Captain Jack Crawford. Under such intriguing titles as Deadwood Dick, The Prince of the Road, Deadwood Dick Trapped, and Deadwood Dick's Doom, the inexpensive paperbacks published by Beadle and Adams were avidly read by young boys of that era. The small books, priced at 10 cents, were popularly known as dime novels. A half-dime library series was even more affordable at just a nickel. By 1899, the Arthur Westbrook Company of Cleveland, Ohio, was reprinting the Wild West Escapades as a Deadwood Dick library series. Hero of more than 100 stories, idolized by a generation of adolescent boys, Deadwood Dick became so famous, the name was claimed by several men who actually lived in Deadwood. Among those adopting the nickname at various times were a black cowboy, Nate Love, the actor, Dick Brown, stagecoach drivers, Richard Cole and Dick Bullock, and the man who maintained the epithet until his death in 1930, Richard Clark. Arriving in Deadwood City in the Dakota Territory, July 3, 1876, to deliver cattle, Nate found the town preparing to celebrate the nation's centennial. The celebration would include contests of strength and abilities, like roping cattle and feats of marksmanship with a six-gun and a rifle. Among the prizes up for grabs were $200 cash and the moniker of Deadwood Dick. Nate Love would claim he won the nickname and the prize money. We arrived in Deadwood in good condition without having any trouble with the Indians on the way up. We turned our cattle over to their new owners at once, then proceeded to take in the town. Taking in the town included entering the 4th of July cowhand competition. Love won the $200 purse in a roping match and a shooting contest. Right then, the assembled crowd named me Deadwood Dick and proclaimed me champion of the Western cattle country. Nate seemed as pleased with earning the nickname as he was with winning the prize money, but hanging around the mining town of Deadwood wasn't part of Nate's plan. He resumed his work herding cattle and left the town of Deadwood within days. Soon he was making regular trips into Mexico, and it was here where he would meet his first love. She was a pretty young Spanish girl that he fell in love with at first sight. After courting her, and discovering that she felt the same way, 
his exuberance and joy overwhelmed him. And while showing off to his compadres, he attempted to rope a passing train. The predictable result was that Nate was yanked off his horse and thrown into a ditch. Still, his friends found it hilarious. They could not contain their laughter as they pulled Nate from the ditch and helped him back onto his horse. During his now regular trips into Mexico, he continued to see his new sweetheart, but one day he arrived to overhear her tell her mother that she would never marry a cowboy. This left Nate crestfallen, as he had intended to ask her to marry. Six or seven months passed and Nate finally returned to Mexico. His sweetheart arrived at the cattle ranch shortly after, looking for her American lover. They rekindled their love affair and began making plans for a wedding. But it was simply not to be. In the spring, she became ill and died suddenly, breaking Nate's heart once again. For a long time, Nate was inconsolable and threw himself into many dangerous situations. Though he finally did meet and marry a fine woman in Denver, Colorado, he never forgot his first love. It was a long distance to drive cattle from old Mexico to northern Wyoming, but to us it was nothing extraordinary, as we were often called to make even greater distances, as the railroads were not so common then as now, and except when beef cattle were sent to the Far East, they were always transported on the hoof over land. Our route lay through southern Texas, Indian Territory, Kansas, and Nebraska, to the Shoshone Mountains in northern Wyoming. We had on this trip 500 head of mostly four-year-old longhorn steers. We did not have much trouble with them until we struck Indian Territory. On nearing the first Indian reservation, we were stopped by a large body of Indian bucks, who said we could not pass through their country unless we gave them a steer for the privilege. Now, as we were following the regular government trail, which was a free public highway, it did not strike us as justifiable to pay our way. Accordingly, our boss refused to give the Indians a steer, remarking that we needed all the cattle we had and proposed to keep them, but he would not mind giving them something much warmer if they interfered with us. This ultimatum of our boss had the effect of starting trouble right there. We went into camp at the edge of the Indian country. All around us was the tall blue grass of that region, which in places was higher than a horse, affording an ideal hiding place for the Indians. As we expected an attack from the Indians, the boss arranged strong watches to keep a keen lookout. We had no sooner finished making camp when the Indians showed up and charged us with a yell or rather a series of yells. I, for one, had got well used to the blood-curdling yells of the Indians, and they did not scare us in the least. We were all ready for them, and after a short but sharp fight, the Indians withdrew, and everything became quiet. But us cowboys were not such guys as to be fooled by the seeming quietness. We knew it was only the calm before the storm, and we prepared ourselves accordingly. But we were all dead tired, and it was necessary that we secure as much rest as possible. So the low watch turned in to rest until midnight, when they were to relieve the upper watch, in whose hands the safety of the camp was placed till that time. Every man slept with his boots on and his gun near his hand. We had been sleeping several hours, but it seemed to me only a few minutes when the danger signal was given. Immediately, every man was on his feet, gun in hand and ready for business. The Indians had secured reinforcements, and after dividing into two bands, one band hid in the tall grass in order to pick us off and shoot us as we attempted to hold our cattle, while the other band proceeded to stampede the herd. But fortunately, there were enough of us to prevent the herd from stringing out on us as we gave our first attention to the cattle and got them to merling. Back and forward through the tall grass, the large herd charged the Indians being kept too busy keeping out of their way to have much time to bother with us. This kept up until daylight, but long before that time we came to the conclusion that this was the worst herd of cattle to stampede we ever struck. They seemed perfectly crazy, even after the last Indian had disappeared. We were unable to account for the strange actions of the cattle until daylight. 
when the mystery was a mystery no longer. The Indians, in large numbers, had hid in the tall grass for the purpose of shooting us from ambush. And being on foot, they were unable to get out of the way of the herd as it stampeded through the grass. The result was that scores of the painted savages were trampled under the hooves of the maddened cattle. And in the early gray dawn of the approaching day, we witnessed a horrible sight. The Indians were all cut to pieces, their heads, limbs, trunk, and blankets all being ground up into an inseparable mass, as if they had been through a sausage machine. The sight was all the more horrible as we did not know the Indians were hidden in the grass during the night, but their presence there accounted for the strange actions of the herd during the night. We suffered no loss or damage, except for the loss of our rest, which we sorely needed, as we were all pretty well played out. However, we thought it might be advisable to move our herd to a more desirable and safe camping place. Not that we greatly feared any more trouble from the Indians, not soon at any rate, but only to be better prepared and in better shape to put up a fight if attacked. The second night, we camped on the open plain where the grass was not so high, and where the camp could be better guarded. After eating our supper and placing the usual watch, the men again turned in, expecting this time to get a good night's rest. It was my turn to take the first watch, and with the other boys who were to watch with me, we took up advantageous positions on the lookout. Everything soon became still. The night was dark and sultry. It was getting along toward midnight when all at once we became aware of a roaring noise in the north like a thunder, slowly growing louder as it approached. And I said to the boys that it must be a buffalo stampede. We immediately gave the alarm and started for our herd to get them out of the way of the buffalo. But we soon found that despite our utmost efforts, we would be unable to get them out of the way. So we came to the conclusion to meet them with our guns and try to turn the buffalo from our direction if possible and prevent them from going through our herd. Accordingly, all hands rode to meet the oncoming stampede, pouring volley after volley into the almost solid mass of rushing beasts. They paid no more attention to us than they would have paid to a lot of boys with pea shoes. On they came, a maddened, plunging, snorting, bellowing mass of horns and hooves. One of our companions, a young fellow by the name of Cal Circe, who was riding a young horse, here began to have trouble Come in controlling on. his mouth. And before any of us could reach him, his horse bolted right in front of the herd of buffalo, and in a trice, the horse and rider went down the whole herd passed over them. After the herd passed over, we could only find a few scraps of poor Cal's clothing, and the horse he had been riding was reduced to the size of a jackrabbit. The buffalo went through our herd killing five head and crippling many others, and scattering them all over the plain. This was the year that the great buffalo slaughter had commenced, and such stampedes were common then. It seemed to me that as soon as we got out of one trouble, we got into another on this trip. It was a bright, clear fall day, October 4th, 1876, when quite a large number of us boys had started out over the range hunting strays, which had been lost for some time. We had scattered over the range, and I was riding along alone when all at once I heard the well-known war whoop and noticed not far away a large party of Indians making straight for me. They were all well mounted and they were in full war paint, which showed me that they were on the war path. And as I was alone and had no wish to be scalped by them, I decided to run for it. So I headed for Yellow Horse Canyon and gave my horse the rein. But as I had considerable objection to being chased by a lot of painted savages without some remonstrance, I turned in my saddle every once in a while and gave them a shot by way of a greeting. And I had the satisfaction of seeing a painted brave tumble from his horse and go rolling in the dust every time my rifle spoke. The Indians were by no means idle all this time, as their bullets were singing all around me rather lively, and one of them passing through my thigh. But it did not amount to much. Reaching Yellow Horse Canyon, I had about decided to stop and make a stand when one of their bullets caught me in the leg, passing clear through it and through my horse, killing him. (laughs) 
Quickly falling behind him, I used his dead body for a breastwork and stood the Indians off for a long time. As my aim was so deadly, and they had lost so many that they were careful to keep out of range. But finally my ammunition gave out, and the Indians were quick to find this out, and they at once closed in on me. But I was by no means subdued. Wounded as I was and almost out of my head, I fought with my empty gun until finally overpowered. When I came to my senses, I was in the Indians' camp. My wounds had been dressed with some kind of herbs, the wound in my breast, just over the heart, was covered thickly with herbs and bound up. My nose had been nearly cut off. Also, one of my fingers had been nearly cut off. These wounds I received when I was fighting my captors with my empty gun. What caused them to spare my life, I cannot tell, but I think it was partly because I proved myself a brave man. And all savages admire a brave man when they have captured a man whose fighting powers were out of the ordinary. They generally kept him, if possible, as he was needed in the tribe. Then again, Yellow Dog's tribe was composed of largely half-breeds, and there was a large percentage of colored blood in the tribe. And as I was a colored man, they wanted to keep me as they thought I was too good a man to die. Be that as it may, they dressed my wounds and gave me plenty to eat but the only grub they had was buffalo meat, which they cooked over a fire of buffalo chips. But of this, I had all I wanted to eat. For the first few days after my capture, they kept me tied, hand and foot. At the end of that time, they untied my feet, but kept my hands tied for a couple days longer, when I was given my freedom, but was always closely watched by members of the tribe. Three days after my capture, my ears were pierced, and I was adopted into the tribe. The operation of piercing my ears was quite painful in the method used, as they had a small bone secured from a deer's leg, a small thin bone rounded at the end and as sharp as a needle. They used this to make the holes, then strings made from the tendons of a deer were inserted in place of thread of which the Indians had none. The horn earrings were placed in my ears and the same kind of salve made from herbs of which they placed on my wounds was placed on my ears and they soon healed. The bullet holes in my leg and breast also healed in a surprisingly short time. That was a good salve, all right. As soon as I was well enough, I took part in the Indian dances. One kind or another was in progress all the time. The war dance and the medicine dance seemed to be the most popular. When in the war dance, the savages danced around me in a circle, making gestures, chanting, and every now and then a blood-curdling yell, always keeping time to a sort of music provided by stretching buffalo skins tightly over a hoop. When I was well enough, I joined the dances, and I think I soon made a good dancer. The medicine dance varies from the war dance, only that in the medicine dance, the Indians danced around a boiling pot, the pot being filled with roots and water, and they dance around it while it boils. The medicine dance occurs about daylight. I very soon learned their ways and to understand them, though our conversation was mostly carried on by means of signs. They soon gave me to understand that I was to marry the chief's daughter promising me 100 ponies to do so, and she was literally thrown in my arms. As for the lady, she seemed perfectly willing, if not anxious, to become my bride. She was a beautiful woman, or rather girl. In fact, all the squaws of this tribe were good-looking, out of the ordinary, but I had no notions just then and did not want to get married under such circumstances. But for prudence' sake, I seemed to enter into their plans but at the same time keeping a sharp lookout for a chance to escape. I noted where the Indians kept their horses at night, even picking out the handsome and fleet Indian pony which I meant to use should opportunity occur. I seemed to fall in with the Indians' plans and seemed to them so contented that they gave me more and more freedom and relaxed the strict watch they had kept on me. And finally, in about 30 days from the time of my capture, my opportunity arrived. My wounds were now nearly well and gave me no trouble. 
It was a dark, cloudy night, and the Indians, grown careless in their fancied security, had relaxed their watchfulness. After they had all thrown themselves on the ground and the quiet of the camp proclaimed them all asleep, I got up, crawling on my hands and knees, using the greatest caution of fear of making a noise. I crawled about 250 yards to where the horses were picketed, and going up to the Indian pony I had already picked out, I slipped the skin thong into its mouth, which the Indians used for a bridle, one of which I had secured and carried in my shirt for some time for this particular purpose. Then, springing to its back, I made for the open prairie in the direction of the home ranch in Texas, 100 miles away. All that night I rode as fast as my horse could carry me, and the next morning, 12 hours after I left the Indians' camp, I was safe on the home ranch again, and my joy was without bounds, as such a reception I received from the boys. <laughs> They said they were just one day late, and if it hadn't been for a fight they had with some of the same tribe, they would have been to my relief. As it was, they did not expect to ever see me again alive. But they knew that if the Indians did not kill me and gave me only half a chance, that I would get away from them. But now that I was safe home again, nothing mattered much, and nothing was too good for me. It was a mystery to them how I managed to escape death with such wounds as I had received, the marks of which I will carry to my grave, and it is as much a mystery to me as the bullet that struck me in the breast, just over the heart, passed clear through, coming out of my back just below the shoulder. Likewise, the bullet in my leg passed clear through, then through my horse, killing him. Those Indians are certainly wonderful doctors, and then I am naturally tough as I carry the marks of 14 bullet wounds on different parts of my body, most any one of which would be sufficient to kill an ordinary man. But I am not even crippled. It seems to me that if ever a man bore a charm, I am the man, as I have had five horses shot out from under me and killed, have fought Indians and Mexicans in all sorts of situations, and have been in more tight places than I can remember. Yet. I have always managed to escape with only the mark of a bullet or a knife as a reminder. The fight with Yellow Dog's tribe is probably the closest call I ever had, and as close a call as I ever want. The fleet Indian pony which carried me to safety on that memorable hundred-mile ride I kept for about five years. I named him the Yellow Dog Chief, and he lived on the best the ranch afforded until his death which occurred in 1881 never having anything to do except an occasional race, as he could run like a deer. I thought too much of him to use him on the trail, and he was the special pet of everyone on the home ranch and for miles around. I heard afterwards that the Indians pursued me that night for quite a distance, but I had too much the start, and besides I had the fastest horse the Indians owned. I have never since met any of my captors of that time, as they knew better than to venture into our neighborhood again. My wound healed nicely thanks to the good attention the Indians gave me. With the march of progress came the railroad, and no longer were we called upon to follow the longhorn steers or mustangs on the trail. While the immense cattle ranges, stretching away in the distance as far as the eye could see, now began to be dotted with cities and towns, and the cattle industry which once held a monopoly in the West now had to give way to the industry of the farm and the mill. To us wild cowboys of the range, used to the wild and unrestricted life of the boundless plains, the new order of things did not appeal, and many of us became disgusted and quit the wildlife for the pursuits of our more civilized brother. I was among that number, and in 1890 I bid farewell to the life I had followed for over 20 years. It was with genuine regret that I left the Longhorn Texas cattle and the wild mustangs of the range, but the life had, in great measure, lost its attractions, and so I decided to quit and try something else for a while. During my life so far, I had no chance to secure an education, except the education of the plains and the cattle business. In this, I recognize no superior being. Gifted with a splendid memory and quick observation, 
I learned and remembered things that others passed by and forgot, and I have yet to meet the man who can give me instruction in the phases of a life which I spent so long. After quitting the cowboy life, I struck out for Denver. Here, I met and married the present Mrs. Love, my second love. We were married on August 22, 1889, and she is with me now a true and faithful partner and says she is not one bit jealous of my first love, who lies buried in the city of Old Mexico. One year later, in 1890, I accepted a position in the Pullman service on the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad, running between Denver and Salida, Colorado. The Pullman service was in its infancy, so to speak, and there was as much difference between the Pullman sleeping cars of those days and the present as there is between an ox team and the automobile. It has always seemed strange to me that so many Americans rush off to Europe and the foreign countries every year in search of health and pleasure, or to climb the Alps in Switzerland and to view the scenery of the old world when our own North America, the New World, offers so many better opportunities to study Dame Nature in all her phases. And I always say to the traveling American, see America. How many of you have done so? Only those who have seen this grand country of ours can justly appreciate the grandeur of our mountains and rivers, valley and plain, canyon and gorge, lakes and springs, cities and towns, the grand evidences of God's handiwork scattered all over this fair land, over which waves the stars and stripes. I think you will agree with me that this grand country of ours is the peer of any in the world, and that volumes cannot begin to tell the wonders of it. Then, after taking such a trip, you will say with me, see America. I have seen a large part of America, and am still seeing it but the life of a hundred years would be all too short to see our country. America, I love thee, sweet land of liberty, home of the brave and the free. Nate Love's stories mimic the style of Western dime novels of the time. He was certain to have read these popular works of fiction, as well as autobiographical works from Calamity Jane and Buffalo Bill. He was undoubtedly aware of the level of celebrity many of his white cowboy contemporaries were enjoying, though many posthumously. Whether he emulated, postulated, ruminated, or fictionalized his recollections of the Old West doesn't matter. Nate Love's Wild West is a land of opportunity a place where dedication and determination outweigh circumstance. Not only did Nate lift himself up and out of his humble beginnings, he wrote himself right into history as a hero. Nate Love worked as a Pullman porter for 15 years, earning a coveted third stripe on his uniform sleeve. But he tired of being away from his family and eventually took a job with the General Securities Company of Los Angeles. Here, he worked as a courier and finished writing his book. He moved his family to the city of Santa Monica, close to the Pacific Ocean. Love was proud of the success that he had achieved in his lifetime, and he wanted to be sure he demonstrated this for his readers. Before his book was finished, he took his family to a photographer's studio, along with his fighting clothes, as he called them, and had his picture taken. He is pictured in his cowboy clothes in two different photos, which have become widely recognized portraits, not only of the African-American cowboy known as Nate Love or Deadwood Dick, but also as the iconic image of all black cowboys of the West. Handsome, confident, capable. Nate Love has truly become an American icon. The excerpts taken from Nate Love's autobiography do not appear exactly as they do in his book. Some have been edited for time, spelling, and grammar, and certain segments are revealed in different order than in their original form.
Many resources were used in researching this episode. Although every effort has been made to provide facts, some discrepancies may arise. I would like to acknowledge the following resources. The Life and Adventures of Nate Love, better known in cattle country as Deadwood Dick, by himself, A True History of Slavery Days, Life on the Great Cattle Ranges and on the Plains of the Wild and Woolly West, based on facts and personal experiences of the author, by Nate Love. Deadwood.com The City of Deadwood.com Nate Love by Barbara Lee Bloom Wikipedia.org and Kathy Weiser Alexander at legendsofamerica.com Stay tuned to hear what's coming up on the next episode of the Drift and Ramble podcast. Before I tell you about that, I want to tell you that we were recently honored to be interviewed by the venerable Dan Lizette at Podcast Digest. Dan has an amazing show and has interviewed some of the biggest names in podcasting. I highly recommend his show and I would do that even if he hadn't taken time to speak with me. Podcast Digest is a highly engaging opportunity to go behind the scenes and get inside the minds of some of podcasting's brightest stars. I'm humbled to be included in Dan's impressive list of interviews, and I hope you will seek out, support, and subscribe to Podcast Digest. The interview appears on episode 130, so fans of Drift and Ramble can get the skinny on how our show came to be and what might happen in the future. Once again, the episode with the Drift and Ramble interview is number 130 at Podcast Digest. Podcast Digest is on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Player FM, and just about anywhere else great podcasts are found. Podcast Digest is also on Patreon.com, Facebook, and Twitter at at PodDigest. We'd like to thank the folks who appeared in this episode and introduce an amazing new voice talent by the name of Gibson, who appeared on our show. Gibson plays the role of a young passenger on the train. Gibson is the son of Toby from the Secret Transmission podcast, a great show that tries to explain the unexplainable. You can find them on iTunes and follow them on Twitter at Secret Transpod. One of our favorite episodes is titled After Dark Episode 2, where Gibson fearlessly espouses his views about Slenderman. Check out the Secret Transmission podcast on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and Stitcher. Another train passenger was our very own Cheryl Blizzen. Cheryl also plays the role of Deadwood magazine writer Janine P. Gurin, and I played the role of Nate Love. As always, we'd like to say thank you to the Potter family for welcoming us into the family and for everything they do to help listeners find great podcasts and podcasters help find great listeners. How does it work? Simply search the Potter family hashtag and you'll be introduced to hundreds of great podcasts, including everything from full cast audio dramas to sci-fi and comic book geekdom, movie reviews, history, horror, comedy, and crime stories, and just about everything else you can imagine. That's hashtag Potter Family. Folks, if you enjoy this show, keep in mind that we are completely listener-supported. Please consider supporting our podcast on Patreon.com. It only takes a dollar or two to make a huge difference for your favorite podcasts, and we wouldn't be asking if we didn't need your support. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash drift and ramble. That's patreon.com slash drift and ramble. Now here's what's coming up on the next episode of the Drift and Ramble podcast. A young boy is fascinated by firearms and incendiary devices. On July 4th, his fireworks become unforgettable as he burns down his own boarding school. His father sends him out to sea thinking he can't get into too much trouble on a boat. But when he returns, he has done something remarkable, and it changes history. On the next Drift and Ramble podcast, find out how this ocean voyage led to a revolutionary design in revolvers. It's the story of the Six Gun on the next Drift and Ramble podcast.
until we meet again, I'm Steve Blizzen. See you at the next installment of the Drift and Ramble podcast. The Drift and Ramble podcast is a Clear Voice Media production, hosted and produced by Steve Blizzen, with segment research and voice acting by Cheryl Blizzen. Additional contributions and content have been made possible by support from individuals dedicated to the art and science of storytelling and exploring the still fertile promise of the American West. Si, senor!